So the Great Commission, a gospel medical missionary evangelism training webinar. We're continuing tonight. This is night number five. We're calling this module number five. We're going, of course, back to school. And the three things we have to be students here in the center is what? Pious, intelligent, and studious. studious. Amen. And for those of you watching on the channel, pious, intelligent, and studious. Praise God. So tonight's lesson, diet, discernment, and decision. Diet, discernment, and decision. There's a lot that goes into this title. I'm sure you probably have an idea which direction we're going with this tonight. We're praying for God's blessing. Amen. So just to recap very, very briefly, our three cornerstone quotes from the spirit of prophecy. Number one, Councils on Health, page 533. I wish to tell you that soon there will be no work done in ministerial lines, but medical missionary work. So that is the most important thing we have to understand. Soon and very soon, that's all the work we'll be doing in the context of the loud cry to the world, bringing out the other sheep into this fold that Jesus spoke about in John 10, 16. Number two, seven testimonies, page 62, paragraph one. We have come to a time when every member of the church should take hold of medical missionary work. Again, that means you and that means myself. Take hold of it, mean, meaning taking part in it and actually conducting and doing it with God's help. Number three, Councils on Health, page 540. Again, the work of the true medical missionary is largely what? It is largely a spiritual work. So we have to make sure that we do it all in the context of what we've been teaching and sharing this entire week, that the spiritual part has to be involved in the work or it's not true medical missionary work. Short story, true story. Very good friend of ours, family friend, a few years back, maybe four or five years ago or so, uh, went to a medical missionary training facility. I won't call the name of the place. I won't even mention the state, but she attended there for several months, and she was very blessed by it. She learned that this particular location had Jesus as the center. It was true medical missionary training. When she finished that training, she went to another state now, to another very well-known, high-level, medical missionary institution that I won't name in another state. She stayed there also and learned for several months. What she found when she was there was this. This particular institution did not have Jesus at the center. The focus seemed to be more on training students to become medical professionals to be able to get jobs in worldly medical institutions and hospitals when they completed their stu studies at this particular institution. Now I'll ask you a question. Is that in God's order? Well, let's take a look. Inspiration will answer. This is from 1T, page 560. Sixth Dwight says this, nine months after the December 25th, 1865 vision. Now that vision was a vision where the Lord told her that our people as a whole, as a denomination, have been negligent in regard to health reform, very negligent. So God gave her a vision that we need to step it up and live up to the light that she's given us. She says, nine months after the December 25th, 1865 vision, the Battle Creek Sanitarium, then called the Western Health Reform Institute, was opened in September 1866. Also, their first health journal called the Health Reformer was published in August 1866, the month before. But soon thereafter came what? A warning from heaven, a warning from heaven. Here's the warning. The Lord told her, the health reform is a branch of the special work of God for the benefit of his people. It's a very important and key component to that. I saw that in an institution established among us, the greatest danger, the greatest danger would be of its managers departing from the spirit of the present truth and from that simplicity which should ever characterize the disciples of Christ. Hmm. A warning was given me against lowering the standard of truth in any way in such an institution in order to help the feelings of unbelievers and thus secure their patronage. In other words, brother, sister, the word, the key word here is compromise, compromising. The Lord showed her, we cannot compromise. I've given you the health reform truth, the message. You have to take it as it is and live it and apply it and implement it just as I gave it to you. But they compromised. So this is what she was shown 
from Selected Messages, Book 1, page 193, titled, The Alpha and the Omega. During the summer of 1904, at a critical point in the crisis over the promulgation by Dr. J. H. Kellogg of pantheistic theories, and at a time when he was advocating unsound policies, compromise, relating to the management of our medical work, Ellen G. White sounded a number of warnings, which were assembled and published for the author in a 60-page pamphlet, Special Testimony Series B, number two, entitled, Testimonies for the Church, containing letters to physicians and ministers, giving messages of warning and words of counsel and admonition regarding our present situation. That's a very long title, isn't it? But it's very important. In two of these communications, she refers to what? The Alpha and the what? Omega. The Alpha and the Omega. Watch this. 7 BC 188. She says, Be not deceived. Many will depart from the faith giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. We have now before us the alpha of this danger, Satan getting in the mix as far as the health reform message is concerned, the true health reform message, and kind of obliterating and taking away God's original plan, which was to have the gospel included with health reform. The omega will be of what? A most startling nature, she says, startling nature. Ministry of Healing 254. The mastermind in the confederacy of evil, that's Satan, is ever working to keep out of sight the words of God and to bring human opinions into view. Private interpretation. Very dangerous. He, Satan, he tries to keep us from hearing the voice of God saying, this is the way, walk in it. Isaiah 30, verse 21. Through perverted educational processes, he is doing his utmost to obscure heaven's light. So what Satan did was get involved in the educational process of our denomination, of all of our schools, at the lowest level. And he's been very successful with that. So in turn, this is now the omega of apostasy. So now everything in our educational system has been warped and it has been compromised at the highest levels, at the highest levels. So now our educational system, our major universities are all basically walking after the ways of the world the ways of the world. So God's original plan for health reform has been skewed. It's been altered a great, a great way. So let's talk about cause and effect. Cause and effect. Now when I was at a very young age, a couple of brief testimonies, I was about eight years old and I can recall a very, very warm day in California. And all the kids in the neighborhood were playing outside for several hours. Beautiful hot day. And I can recall coming in the house and telling my mother that I was very thirsty. So she gave me, she made some Kool-Aid. I drank all these cups of Kool-Aid. I remember it was strawberry Kool-Aid. It was all red. And I had several cups of it. So I'm sitting there for a few minutes. And after about maybe 10 minutes or so, I tell my mom, I say, Mom, Mommy. I feel like I'm going to throw up. She said, well, go to the bathroom. So I ran down the hall to the bathroom. I ran into the bathroom. I lifted up the toilet seat. And as soon as I lifted it up, everything came out. And it was a sea of red Kool-Aid in the toilet. That was one of my earliest vivid memories of whatever you consume in your system has an effect on how you feel. Now, a little later in life, I had actually three situations where I obtained or acquired food poisoning. Three times. The first time I was about 14, 14 years old, and I ate a Polish sausage from Woolworths. Anybody remember the store Woolworths from back in the day? Ate it at Woolworths, downtown San Francisco, got home, and I was so sick I thought that I was going to die. Two years later, about 16 years old, I ate a Polish sausage hot dog at Candlestick Park at a San Francisco Giants baseball game. Same thing. I was so sick for um, almost a week, I thought I was going to die. Third time, I'm about 22 years old, and I eat at McDonald's a bacon, egg, and cheese biscuit for breakfast. Actually, I think I had two of them. Same thing, major food poisoning. 
Now, what was the common denominator with those three foods? The common denominator was swine's flesh, which the Bible clear, clearly tells us what? Do not eat, do not even touch it, pork flesh. Now, cause and effect. Brother, sister, the lesson is this. This simple little item here, this little round disc, we all know it's called what? It's called a plate. This little item here may seem innocent on the surface, but I'm here to tell you, the ruin of tens, hundreds, thousands, yay, millions, and even billions of people have been compromised based on what they place on this and what they consume on a meal by meal, daily, weekly, monthly, yearly, and decade by decade basis. This little thing right here is very, very serious. So what we have to do is we have to educate our people on what needs to go on here, number one, how often we need to eat, number two, how far our meals should be spread apart, number three, all this is under the context and the auspices of the science of eating. There is a science to eating, absolutely so. So this is a very high-tech, highly resoluted, close-up, magnified view of the human taste buds. Again, these little fellas might seem uh, innocent on the surface, but brother, sister, I'm here to tell you, these things, as the Bible says, in fact, let's go to the Bible. Why don't we go there right now? Proverbs 18. We're going to let the Bible speak. Proverbs chapter 18. Proverbs, the book of Proverbs, written by the wisest man who ever lived, our brother, our dear brother Solomon. Proverbs 18, let's pick up at verse number 20. We all there, amen? Proverbs 18 and verse 20. And the Bible says, A man's belly shall be satisfied with the fruit of his mouth. Hmm. And with the increase of his lips shall he be filled. Key verse, 21, key verse. Death and life are in the power of the what? The tongue. And they that love it shall eat the fruit thereof. Did you get the lesson, brother, sister? Life and death, death and life are in the power of this little organ right here. And many people fall and fail and fall short because of the power of this instrument. So small, but so significant. So Joel 3.14 tells us multitudes, multitudes in the valley of what? Decision. For the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. How many times do we stand in front of this metal box, just like this young lady's doing here, sometimes in the middle of the night, and we open the door and we're just looking, trying to decide what we need to eat? Well, again, the title of this message is Diet, Discernment, and Decision. Our diet has a major impact on what we decide and what we discern and how we discern things, not only in life in general, but the truth as well, present truth in particular, and we're going to see that tonight. Powerful statement here, Councils and Health 37. Sister White says, many have inquired of me, what course shall I take to best preserve my health? My answer is, and there's five points here, let's take these one at a time. One, cease to transgress the laws of your being, meaning the laws of life or the laws of health. God's plan, the eight laws of health. Stop transgressing or violating the laws of health, number one. Two, cease to gratify depraved appetite. Hmm. Stop indulging in appetite. Eat the way God said to eat. Simple, on time, not overeating, not overdoing. Depraved. Hmm. Number three, eat simple food. We are told that we have to eliminate the large amount of cooking that we partake of every day. Remember, and we all know this, when you get to about 118 degrees, when you're cooking food items, at that point you're burning off all the nutritional benefit and reward on the outside, the outer portion or the brand. We have to keep our food as simple as possible. Nice balance between 80, 70 to 80 percent raw, and between 30 to 20 percent, what? Cooked. Amen. Number four, dress healthfully, which will require modest simplicity. Keep your limbs covered as much as possible, preferably at all times. That's very important. 
Number five, work healthfully. Now, you know, James White, we're told, literally worked himself to death. So we can't overwork as well. We have to be careful with how much we work. Our bodies can only take so much. But she says, if we adhere to all five of these points, she says, you will not be what? Sick. You will not be sick. So those are words of life, aren't they? Those of you who are taking pictures on your computers at home of your screens, please take this picture and bookmark it. This is a very, very nice equation from heaven, from heaven. Amen. So the book of Genesis, we're told, gives quite a definite account of social and individual life. This is Fundamentals of Christian Education, page 22. And yet we have no record of an infant being born blind, deaf, crippled, deformed, or imbecile. Neither one. There is not an instance upon record of a natural death in infancy, childhood, or early manhood. People lived, and they lived a long time, didn't they? Amen. There is no account of men and women dying of disease. Hmm. Obituary notices in the book of Genesis run thus. Quote, and all the days that Adam lived were 930 years, and he died. Quote, and all the days of Seth were 912 years, and he died. Concerning others, the record states, he lived to a good old age, and he died. It was so rare for a son to die before the father that such an occurrence was considered worthy of record. Quote, and Haran died before his father Terah. So people in the book of Genesis lived a long time, didn't they? And not only that, no one was sick in the book of Genesis. In fact, who was the first person in the Bible record, period, to be accounted as sick? Well, let's see. Let's go to the book of Genesis. Let's go there. Genesis chapter 48. Now, we're going to consider what exactly we mean when we're talking about the word sick in the Bible context. Genesis chapter 48. Genesis 48, and we're all familiar, familiar with the story here. The 48th chapter of the book of Genesis. And we're going to start at verse 1. Actually, we're going to read verse 1. We all there, amen? And the Bible says, and it came to pass after these things that one told Joseph, Behold, thy father is what? Sick. And he took with him his two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim. Now this is telling us that Joseph's dad, Jacob, was actually ill. But what do we mean when we actually use the word sick? Are we talking about physically sick or maybe another kind of sick? Well, let's see. Let's go to Genesis chapter 9. Let's go back 30 or so verses to Genesis chapter 9. And let's look at another affliction. Genesis chapter 9. And we're going to pick up at verse 18. Amen. Genesis 9 and verse 18. Lord, please continue to bless these words as we open and read them. Please give us a great lesson tonight, Lord, and beyond. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Genesis 9 and verse 18. And the sons of Noah that went forth of the ark were Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And Ham is the father of Canaan. These are the three sons of Noah, and of them was the whole earth overspread. And Noah began to be an husbandman, and he planted a vineyard. Praise the Lord. 21, key verse. And he drank of the wine and was what? Drunken, and he was uncovered within his tent. So now brother Noah drank some alcohol, became inebriated or drunk. Now would you consider this a type of sickness? Oh yes, absolutely so. Even though he, uh, he voluntarily drank it, he became sick. But what caused him to want to drink the alcohol is the question. Genesis chapter 4. Let's go back a few more chapters. Genesis chapter 4. Genesis chapter 4. And we're going to look at... Verse number, let's start at verse 8. Verse number 8. And the Bible, and we know the context of this, right? This is when Cain and Abel were in the field. And we'll pick it up at verse 8. And Cain talked with his Abel, with Abel his brother, and it came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel his brother and did what? And slew him. 
And the Lord said unto Cain, Where is Abel thy brother? And he said, I know not. Am I my brother's keeper? Now, Cain became the first human murderer, first one. Would we consider Cain to be sick based on, the, on his actions in Genesis chapter 4? I believe we can. I believe we can. Now, here's what we're told. Story of Redemption 35. This is talking about Eve now, our mother Eve. She then plucked for herself of the fruit and ate, and imagined, imagined she felt the quickening power of a new and elevated existence as the result of the exhilarating influence of the forbidden fruit. She was in a strange and unnatural excitement as she sought her husband with her hands filled with the forbidden fruit. This is why I love inspiration. We get the behind the scenes information and status and details about large biblical truths. Now we often have in our minds that Eve took this one piece of fruit, most people believe it's an apple, and she took this one piece of fruit and sought out her husband and gave it to him and convinced him to eat it, right? But it says here what? Her hands were full of the fruit. So she ran with a whole handful, maybe a basket full of fruit to give to offer to her husband. Amen. It goes, she goes on now. She related to him the wise discourse of the serpent and wished to conduct him at once to the tree of knowledge. She told him she had eaten of the fruit and instead of her feeling any sense of death, she realized a pleasing, exhilarating influence. Hmm. As soon as Eve had disobeyed, she became a powerful medium through which the occasion or to occasion the fall of her husband. So Satan used her. But the key here is what she imagined. Was she really feeling this feeling? What does the word imagine mean? The definition. Form of, um, a form a mental image or concept of. To suppose or what? Assume. So she didn't really feel a new heightened experience. She believed she did based on what the serpent told her how she would feel. But it soon wore off, didn't it? Because it wasn't real. The Bible says, or Sister White says, she imagined it. It wasn't the real thing. Christian Timberts in Bible Hygiene, page 151. She says, some are not impressed with the necessity of eating and drinking to the glory of God. The indulgence of appetite affects them in all the relations of life. So not just physical, not just how I vomited as an eight-year-old or had food poisoning three times in my younger years. It affects us in all ways, not just physical. It is seen in the family in the church, in the prayer meeting, and in the conduct of their, conduct of their children. Hmm. It is the curse of their lives. It prevents them from understanding the truths for these last days. You mean to tell me how I eat affects how I interpret and understand spiritual things? Absolutely so. Yes, indeed. Some have sneered at health reform and have said it was all unnecessary that it was an excitement which tended to divert minds from, from present truth, when it actually is present truth. They have said that matters were carried to extremes. Such do not know what they are talking about. I love how Sister White was a straight shooter. Straight shooter. While men and women professing godliness are diseased from the crown of the head to the sole of the feet, while their physical, mental, and moral energies are enfeebled, through a gratification of depraved appetite and excessive labor. And this is all uh, highlighted for a reason. Listen to this. So she's asking the question, physical, mental, and moral, the three aspects of man, mind, body, and spirit. How can they weigh the evidences of truth and comprehend the requirements of God? How can they do it when their minds are benumbed? If their moral and intellectual faculties are beclouded, they cannot appreciate the value of the atonement, the sanctuary message, or the exalted character of the work of God, nor delight in the study of his word. They can't understand it, and they can't rejoice in the beauty of it because of the way they're eating. Their mind has been compromised completely. 1 T 618, 619. The abuses, she says, I love that word. The abuses of the stomach by the gratification of appetite are the fruitful source of most what? Church trials, church problems. You mean it all starts with the stomach? Arguments at the, at the elders table or for church board meetings? It's because of gratification of appetite? Hmm. 
Those who eat and work intemperately and irrationally talk and act irrationally. So there's a direct effect. Remember, cause and effect. Cause and effect. Those who eat and work intemperately and irrationally talk and act the same. An intemperate man cannot be a what? A patient man. He cannot be. It is not necessary to drink alcoholic liquors in order to be intemperate. The sin of intemperate eating, eating too frequently, too much, we talked about that a few minutes ago, and of rich, unwholesome food, tastes good, but not good for us, destroys the healthy action of the digestive organs, affects the what? The brain, diet, discernment, and decision is the name of our message tonight, affects the brain and perverts the judgment, reasoning, preventing rational, calm, healthy thinking and acting. We actually become animalistic because we're eating animal food. You are what you eat. You are what you eat. Councils on Health 67. Let none who profess godliness regard with indifference the health of the body and flatter themselves that intemperance is no sin and will not affect their spirituality. So we eat wrong, we're intemperate with our diet, we have spiritual issues, don't we? According to inspiration. It's a fact. A close sympathy exists between the physical and the moral nature. They go hand in hand, hand in hand. You can't separate the two. This is all highlighted for a reason. Watch this, Ministry of Healing 129. With our first parents, intemperate desire resulted in the loss of Eden. Temperance in all things has more to do with our restoration to Eden than men realize. Mm. So we're talking about restoration to Eden. We're talking about eternal life, aren't we? Because we know that in heaven, Eden will be restored. John saw that all the way, all the way down in the book of Revelation, Revelation chapter 22. Everything's going to be there again, restored, the long lost Eden. Eden. And the tree of life will be for the healing of the nations. We're told that. But we don't really appreciate how our intemperate lifestyles will affect our eternal welfare. The two go hand in hand. So it's very, 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 very serious. Let's go to Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1. And we all know the verse. We're just rereading and laying a foundation. Genesis chapter 1. Starting at verse 26, of course, this is the sixth day, and the Bible declares, And God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image, in the image of God created he him, Male and female created he them. And God blessed them, and God said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply, procreate, and replenish the earth, and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. Genesis chapter 1. This is Youth Instructor, March 5th, 1903. She says, the true object of education is to restore the image of God in the soul. In the beginning, God created man in whose own likeness? His own. And we know that was obliterated after the fall. And in Genesis chapter 5, when Adam and Eve had more sons and daughters, they came and were created in the image of Adam slash Satan. Now in the image of Adam slash Satan. He endowed him with noble qualities. His what? His mind was well balanced, talking about the mind of the first Adam. And all the powers of his being were harmonious. Amen. Perfect homeostasis, everything working in harmony together. But the fall and its effects have perverted these gifts. Sin has marred and well nigh obliterated the image of God and man. It was to restore this, restore what? the image of God and man, the way he was originally, initially created, perfect, that the plan of salvation was devised and a life of probation was granted to man. 
to bring him back to the perfection in which he was first created is the great object of life. The object that underlies every other, that's actually uh, Mind, Character, and Personality, Book 1, page 359. This is Youth Instructor here on the bottom. She says, Adam was a noble being with a powerful what? Mind. A will in harmony with the will of God and affections that centered upon heaven. Watch this. He possessed a body heir to how much disease? None. Adam did not get sick. Perfect man created in Genesis 1, 26, 27. Perfect diet given to him in Genesis 1, 29. Perfect diet for the perfect human being. He possessed a body heir to no disease and a soul bearing the impress of deity. So he was a perfect man. 16, 7 feet, feet tall. Perfect symmetry. No sickness. No disease. And God gave him a perfect diet. Amen. So he could maintain that perfection. Maintain it. So 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Let's go there now. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Back to the New Testament. And we're talking about the mind now. The mind. Now Adam's mind was perfect. But everything changed after he fell. But Christ came to restore in man the image of God, including his mind. Amen. And we're going to see that. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, we're going to start at a very familiar verse, verse 14. 1 Corinthians 2 and 14. We all there? Amen. Praise the Lord. And the Bible declares once again God's word. But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are what? foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. But he that is spiritual judgeth all things, yet he himself is judged of no man. 16. For who hath known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? Question mark. But we have the mind of Christ. Did you get that? So if we're living like Christ, if we're following our King, if we're doing what he says and following him whithersoever he, we goeth, we're going to see in a minute that we can think like him and God can be thinking like Jesus and we can think like him working out, acting out our own impulses. In other words, whatever Jesus says we'll do because we love him and it won't be a matter of a guesswork, we will hear his voice speaking to us. It's that simple. But that all comes in the context of temperate lifestyle, day by day. 1 Peter chapter 4. Let's go. 1 Peter chapter 4. First Peter chapter 4. And verse 1. First Peter 4, 4 and verse 1. And the Bible says... For as much then as Christ hath suffered for us in the flesh, and he did suffer, didn't he? Six hours on that tree for you and I. Arm yourselves likewise with the same what? Mind. For he that hath suffered in the flesh hath ceased from sin. Now I ask you, why would we be told here to arm ourselves with the same mind as Jesus? Doesn't that tell you that we can have his mind? Absolutely so. Otherwise it wouldn't have been said. Just like the Bible says that, uh, that we are able to live without sin. That means we can be sin free. But most people, a lot of people don't believe that these days in 2016. But we can have Jesus' mind. Desire of Ages 668. Let's read it. All true obedience comes from where? The heart. It was hard work with Christ. And if we consent, he will so identify himself with our thoughts and aims. Now I want to make sure we get this lesson. If we consent in working with Jesus, cooperating with heaven, if we do that, this is, what the, this is going to be the result or the fruit of that. He will so identify himself with our thoughts and aims, so blend our hearts and minds into conformity to his will, that when obeying him, we shall be but carrying out our own impulses. I remember the first time I read that, I said, is that possible? Can we actually do that where we're thinking just like Jesus and vice versa? Yes, we can. Yes, we can. Through an appreciation of the character of Christ, through communion with God, sin will become what? Hateful to us 
And it has to get to that point. We have to have enmity, enmity with sin. So communion with God constantly, day by day, we will hate sin. We will love Jesus more. We love sin, don't we? We love the way it tastes, the way it feels, the way it looks. But we can overcome through the blood of Christ. When Jesus speaks of the new heart, he means what? The mind, the mind, the mind, the life, the whole being. To have a change of heart is to withdraw the affections from the world and fasten them upon Christ. Death to the world. To have a new heart is to have a what? A new mind. It's the same thing. Did you get the lesson? New purposes, new motives. What is the sign of a new heart? A changed life, a new creature. Can you say amen? There is a daily, hourly, and I may add, may add minute by minute, dying to selfishness and pride. Youth Instructor, September 26, 1901. So death to the world, death to self. We can have that new mind, but it takes a change in our day by day use of this. This is the key. This is the key. Amen. So food and intelligence, let's talk about that for a second. Now this is a study they did a few years ago of one million students. A study of one million students in New York showed that students who ate lunches that did not include artificial flavors, preservatives, and dyes did 14% better on IQ tests than students who ate lunches with these additives. I wonder why. Physical illness. The connection between body and mind is a strong one. One estimate is that between 50 to 70 percent of visits to the doctor for physical ailments are attributed to what? Psychological factors. You mean that disease or illness can start up here? Is that what the world is saying? The world is saying that. So let's see what the inspired word of God, let's see what the prophet has to say about the same thing. The body and mind relationship. Let's see. First this. There is a divinely appointed connection between sin and disease. And we know that from our studies this whole week. Many times, often, disease is a result of sin. In fact, sin is disease. It is a disease. No physician can practice for a month without seeing this illustrated. One month, she says. Hmm. Council's on Health 325. Sickness of what? The mind prevails everywhere. Nine tenths, nine out of ten, of the diseases from which men suffer have their foundation here. Where? Here, in the mind. In the mind. Perhaps some living home trouble is, like a canker, eating to the very soul and weakening the life forces. You know, problems at home can do that. Studies have shown that. They can do that. Remorse for sin sometimes undermines the constitution and unbalances what? The mind. Unbalances the mind. So, sickness, the mind, a vital connection there, vital. Let's go to Philippians chapter 3. Back to the Bible, Philippians chapter 3. For those of you who may be joining us late, tonight's lesson is diet, discernment, and decision. The connection, the relationship between the mind and what we eat. Philippians chapter 3. Philippians 3. Philippians chapter 3. And we're going to begin at verse... Let's begin at verse 18. Verse 18. Again, the Bible says, For many walk, of whom I have told you often, and now tell you even weeping, that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ whose end is what? Destruction, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is in their shame, who mind earthly things. Is it possible that your belly can be your God? I wonder. I told the story last night of the, the message I heard back in the year 2000 about what's included in chocolate, rat feces and rat hair, and I still ate it for seven years, knowing that it was in there. It didn't matter because I was addicted. Let's go to uh, Deuteronomy chapter 5 now, Deuteronomy 5. So, my belly was my God. But what does the Bible have to say about that? 
Deuteronomy chapter 5. And picking up at verse 6, Deuteronomy 5 and verse 6. Heavenly Father, please continue to bless your words. Please teach us thy will and thy way. We ask as always in Jesus' name. Amen. Deuteronomy 5, starting at verse 6. Verse 6. The Bible says, I am the Lord thy God, which brought thee out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage. Thou shalt have none other gods before me. So you mean to tell me that when we make our belly, our God, we're breaking one of the commandments? Yes, we are. It's a commandment-breaking thing. We're violating God's law. But there's a lesson there we're going to see in a second. There's a lesson. So the laws, these are, these are some very, very critical and crucial statements. Please listen keenly. And those of you who are taking notes, take notes, please. This is Christ's Object Lessons, page 347. <clears throat> Excuse me. She says, transgression of physical law is transgression of the moral law. Did you get the point? For God is as truly the author of physical laws as he is the author of the moral law. So maybe God doesn't see the moral law and the laws of, maybe he doesn't see them, the laws of hell, maybe he doesn't see them separate. Maybe he sees them as all being synonymous. Well, let's see. Let's see. Christian Temperance and Bible Hygiene, page 53. It is as truly a sin to violate the laws of our being, the laws of life or the laws of health, as it is to break the Ten Commandments. Hmm. To do either the laws of our being and the Ten Commandments, to do either is to break God's laws. The same. From God's point of view, the same thing. Let's look at another one. Councils on Diet and Foods, page 40. She says, premature decay and death are the result of walking away from God to follow the ways of the world. He who indulges self must bear the penalty. So there are consequences to how we eat and how we live. In the judgment, in where? In the judgment, she says, we shall see how seriously God regards the violation of the laws of health. No second probation will be granted us. None at all. This is it. Right now. Right now. This is no time for making false moves. So in the judgment, we'll see how seriously God takes it. Especially if we know better. If we know better. Watch this. Education 196 and 197. Knowledge of nature's laws is necessary. There are matters not usually included in the study of physiology that should be considered, she says, matters of far greater value to the student than are many of the technicalities commonly taught under this head or this heading. As the foundation principle of all education in these lines, the youth should be taught that the laws of nature are the laws of God, as truly divine as are the precepts of the Decalogue, again, the Ten Commandments. The laws that govern our physical organism, God has written upon every nerve, muscle, and fiber of the body. Every careless and willful violation of these laws, a slice of chocolate cake at midnight, is a sin against our Creator. How necessary, then, that a thorough knowledge of these laws should be imparted. I submit to you, in my opinion, I submit to you, maybe God doesn't see the Decalogue as being over here, the Ten Commandments, and the laws of our being, or the laws of health, or the laws of life, the eight laws of, of health being over here. Maybe God sees 18 laws that we have to follow implicitly. That's what I'm reading here. That's what I see. So we have to take both of them just as serious as the other. Do you see the point? I hope you do. So the frontal lobe now, we're talking about the area of the brain right here. The executive function of the frontal lobes involve the ability to recognize future consequences resulting from current actions, to choose between good and bad actions, reasoning, right? Everything's reason right here. Override and suppress socially unacceptable responses and determine similarities and differences between things or events. Now this is a worldly point of view. This is from Wikipedia. So what we're going to do is look at the biblical account and compare the worldly point of view to what the Bible says. And there's some very interesting, intriguing similarities here. 
Wikipedia says, we are our frontal lobe helps us or determines how we recognize future consequences resulting from current actions. That's the world's point of view. The Bible boy, a biblical equivalent says we recognize the unfolding of prophecy related to current events. Do you see the comparison there? They're very similar. Very similar. Wikipedia. Wikipedia says the frontal lobe help, helps us to do what? To choose between good and bad actions. The Bible says that the frontal lobe helps us to choose between righteousness and what? Unrighteousness. It's the same thing. The world's point of view and the Bible's point of view. Next. We just read, Wikipedia says that the frontal lobe helps us to override and suppress socially unacceptable responses. Hmm. And that could be in a million different ways. But from the Bible, I see that as just saying that we have to practice temperance in what? All things. They're the same. They're the same. Wikipedia says we are to determine, our frontal lobe helps us to determine similarities and differences between things or events. But from the Bible perspective, we rely on the Holy Spirit for spiritual what? Discernment. It's the same exact thing. Their point of view is one, but we get everything we need from right here in God's Word. The great simplifier of what? Life's problems. Amen. 2T347. The brain nerves which communicate with the entire system are, catch this, the only medium or the only way through which heaven can communicate to man and affect his inmost life. Right up here. This is God's choice. This is the method or means that God has used to communicate to human beings through the brain, specifically the frontal lobe. Whatever disturbs the circulation of the electric currents in the nervous system lessens the strength of the vital powers, and the result is a deadening of the sensibilities of the what? Of the mind. Of the mind. So whatever disturbs, what disturbs the circulation of the electric currents? It's what we eat. It's our lifestyle in general. Eating too late, eating too often, eating too much, not enough water. All these things are involved in breaking up the plain channel of communication between heaven and his people, God and his people. This is a very powerful statement. Take heed. Consul on Diet and Foods, page 389. Eating much flesh will diminish intellectual activity. Hmm. Did you get the lesson, brother, sister, there? Eating much flesh will diminish intellectual activity. So you mean if I eat too much meat, I can't think as well? Students would accomplish, now we have students here, we have students out there on watching the channel. Students would accomplish much more in their studies if they never tasted meat. When the animal part of the human nature is strengthened by meat eating, the intellectual power diminishes proportionately. So the more meat you eat, the more animalistic you become, and basically, the more stupid you become. That's what she's saying. That, I mean, that's what she's really saying, right? Intellectual capacity is diminished, activity diminished, by flesh meat. Flesh meat. Those who indulge in, one, meat eating, two, tea drinking, and three, gluttony, are sowing seeds for a harvest of pain and death. The unhealthful food placed in the stomach strengthens the appetites that war against the soul, highlighted, developing the lower propensities, the base passions, the base passions. An intemperate man cannot be a patient man. I'll leave it at that. We're all adults here. A diet, and our world is full of this activity going on. You hear it on the news every day. The men are acting like animals in our world today, animals, literally. A diet of flesh meat tends to develop animalism. You are what you eat. It's really that simple. A development of animalism lessens spirituality, rendering the mind incapable of understanding truth. So I submit to you, and I ask you, is flesh eating healthy? It is not. It is not. God gave man a flesh diet after the flood as an emergency measure because all the vegetation was washed away. But it was only going to be temporary. And he even told them what you can eat and what you can't, the clean versus the unclean. They chose the unclean because it tasted good. They still ate it. Even though God warned them, don't eat it, we're going to eat it anyway, Lord, because we enjoy it better. That's why they were all sick, just like the world today.
God gave our first parents the food he designed that the race should eat. It was contrary to his plan to have the life of any creature taken. He wanted every creature to live, right? There was to be no death in Eden. That wasn't God's plan. God gave man no permission to eat animal food until after the flood. But what did they do? They ate it anyway. The people who lived before the flood ate animal food and gratified their lust until their cup of iniquity was full and God cleansed the earth of his moral pollution by a flood. So God told them or didn't give them any permission to eat it, but they were still experimenting and doing this and amalgamating and all these things because that's human nature, right? To go against God. Carnal. We read that last night. So Satan's master plan. God has a plan. Satan has a counterfeit. Satan gathered the fallen angels together to devise some way of doing the most possible evil to the human family. The most. What a meeting that must have been. One proposition after another was made. So all these demons are submitting their their points of view and their ideas to the master, their master, Satan. Until finally Satan himself thought of a plan. He would take the fruit of the vine, also wheat. You know, wheat is a problem these days. We'll get into that during the practical lesson in a few months. Also wheat, this is prophecy, and other things given by God as food and would convert them into what? Poisons, GMO which would ruin man's physical, mental, and moral powers, the three aspects of man, and so overcome the senses that Satan should have full control. Through perverted appetite, the world would be made corrupt. Can you say, how can we not see that this woman was a prophet? The fact that Satan had this meeting, he made a plan as far as corrupting the food source is concerned, and he's accomplished that today. It's there. God is good. His most effective temptation today, Satan comes to man as he came to Christ. He well knows his power to overcome man upon this point, to overcome, to, uh, to indulge in appetite. He overcame Adam and Eve and Eden upon appetite, and they lost their blissful home. Entire cities have been blotted from the face of the earth because of the debasing crimes and revolting iniquity that made them a blot upon the universe. Watch this. Indulgence of appetite was the foundation of all their sins. Appetite. It all starts right here. Remember the, the close-up I gave you, the magnification of the taste buds? It all starts right here. Everything starts right here. Brain nerves. The secret of Satan's strategy, the enemy's strategy. Intemperance of any kind benumbs the perceptive organs and so weakens the brain nerve power that eternal things are not appreciated. Hmm. but placed upon a level with the common, and that's true. The higher powers of the mind designed for elevated purposes are brought into slavery to the baser passions. If our physical habits are not right, our mental and moral powers cannot be strong, for great sympathy exists between the physical and the what? And the moral. I know we're kind of overstating things a little bit, but we have to make the point. We have to make the point. There's a connection. So God decided, well, they're living this way, they're eating wrong, I have to do what? I have to shorten their life, life up span. I have to do it. He had no choice. The diet of animals is vegetables and grains. That's what they eat. Must the vegetables be animalized? In other words, do we have to eat animals to get a secondary uh, way of getting our vegetables through the animals that eat the vegetables? That's not what God wants us to do. Many people think you have to eat animals to get Protein to get vitamin B? Oh no, we can go straight to the source. Must they be incorporated into the system before you can get them? Must we obtain our vegetable diet by eating the flesh of dead creatures? Absolutely not. God provided fruit in its natural state from the earth for our first parents. After the fall, the eating of flesh was suffered or allowed in order to shorten the period of the existence of the long-lived race. He cut us short. We didn't deserve to live 900 years. We didn't deserve it. It was allowed because of the hardness of the hearts of men. After the flood, the people ate. This is both these slides, by the way, are Councils on Diet and Foods, page 373, if you're taking notes. She says, after the flood, the people ate largely of animal food. 
God saw that the ways of man were corrupt and that he was disposed to exalt himself proudly against his creator and to follow the inclinations of his own heart. And he permitted that long-lived race to eat animal food to do what? Shorten their sinful lives. Soon after the flood, the race began to rapidly decrease in size and in length of years. So from living to be over 900 years old, down to 600, 5, 4, 3, 200, and now we're, we're blessed, according to the book of Psalms, to live three score and ten, right? Only by, by means or way of strength and health. So he wanted to cut our lives short and our size. So we went from being 16 or 17 feet tall to what? Five feet tall, six feet tall in most cases. Some people are taller, amen. So I want to read this. This is very important. People in the 1800s didn't die because of diet. Heart disease was not included in textbooks. Cancer, diabetes, and hypertension were considered wealthy diseases because most Americans could not afford meat. Only the rich people got these diseases because they could afford the flesh. Wealthy people back then ate like most Americans eat today. Everybody can afford it now. Here's the lesson. When meat began to become affordable in the 20th century, last century, the rate of chronic disease skyrocketed. The cause was a shift from a plant-based dominant diet to animal-based diets. Everything changed around 1940, 1950. Everything shifted around that time. The biggest dietary change in human history ushered in an era of eating-related diseases. By the mid-1900s, we ate more meat than we weighed. 225 pounds of meat per year, mid-1900s. That's a lot of meat. That's a lot of full colons, would you say? So the average consumption of meat per year per person in these countries, Japan, which by the way has one of the highest, uh, in the top three easy, of lifespans on this earth today. They eat 44 kilograms of flesh per year, per person. England, 80, a little higher. France, 101. Australia 110, United States of America 125 kilograms. That comes out to 275 pounds of dead flesh animal meat per year per person. That's a lot of meat. You know they say that uh, John Wayne, was it John Wayne? When they, when he, no, Elvis Presley. When he died and they did his biopsy or whatever they did, they found 40 pounds of undigested flesh in his colon. 40 pounds. That's a lot. That's what killed him. That's what killed him. So we know death is three-fifths eat, and these things will definitely kill you. We have to avoid them at all costs. These images may disturb you. We have to be careful not only what we eat, but where we eat. Where we eat is very important. So fast food places like Wendy's, you have employees that are doing these things, right? You can't see these things taking place when you're on one side of the counter and they're behind the counter and around behind the big machines and behind the, the grill, but they're doing it. How about Taco Bell? Are you hungry for a taco today? Yes. We have to be careful where we decide to eat our meals, don't we? We, should, we have to get back to a, eating our own provisions. That's your lettuce, same uh, KFC. KFC. And what does KFC stand for? Keeping a full colon. Keeping a full colon. KFC again, something going on with the potatoes there. See, they don't want you to see the bottom half of the logo. That's very disturbing. This man is doing the unthinkable, urinating in your nachos. Now, these, these people don't care about your health. They don't care. They want to be on YouTube making fools of themselves, but they're killing you at the same time. Same thing here. This is Pizza Hut, video caught a pizza worker caught urinating in the sink in the kitchen at Pizza Hut. <laughs> Have mercy. A few more facts. Consuming more calcium doesn't prevent bone loss or strengthen bones. Exercise does that. That's a myth. That's a myth. Consuming more milk actually takes away the calcium. It's just the opposite. But they want you to think it's beneficial. Three glasses of milk per day is the same as eating 21 slices of bacon. Now, I used to eat bacon every day, swine bacon, a bacon and eggs, my favorite breakfast. But I was enlightened. Praise the Lord. Can you say amen? One pint of ice cream is the same as eating 24 slices of bacon. 
one pint of dairy ice cream. If you have to have ice cream, if you have to have it, make it at home. Amen. Make it at home. Let the diet reform be what? Progressive. This is, this is very, very key counsel here. Let the people be taught how to prepare food without the use of milk or butter. It can be done. Millions of people in this world, even outside of our denomination, are eating this way. Have the children of the world become wiser than the children of light? I hope not. Tell them that the time will soon come. It is here when there will be no safety at all in using eggs, milk, cream, or butter because this ease or disease in animals is increasing in proportion to the increase of wickedness among men. There was a huge shift around 1980. I wish we had time to go over that. But everything changed around 1980. Crime rate, uh, trouble in the world, disasters, disease in the animals, everything went up. Prison population, everything changed. The time is near when, because of the iniquity of the fallen race, the whole animal creation will groan on the diseases that curse our earth. Our earth. So this is a reason, one reason, why we should eliminate flesh meat from our diet. Not only because it affects the mind, but because the animals are diseased. So we become, we become mentally and physically sick on many levels, on many, many levels. But I have a, I have a, a surprise for you, and I'm going to read this twice. I'm going to repeat this statement two times because it is so important. Sister White says, Testimonies, Volume 2, page 370, she says, and from the light given me, sugar, what did I say? Sugar, when largely used, is more injurious than meat. That's 2 Testimony, page 370. I'm going to read it one more time. She says, and from the light given me, from the light given me, sugar, when largely used, is more injurious than meat. Now, that's a very, very powerful statement. So what I'm going to do now, I'd like to introduce to you Sister Marcia Bridges, my, my dear, lovely wife. We're going to have a prayer, and she's going to take over the second segment of tonight's session. Amen? Amen. Let us pray, Sister. We can kneel. Can you kneel? Okay. Blessed Heavenly Father, we come to you, giving you again thanks, honor, glory, and praise, dominion, and power. We pray, Father, that as we continue on this very vital subject, the effect of diet on our discernment, our decision-making power, on the mind, that you would bless Sister Bridges, Lord, with your Holy Spirit. Be with her, comfort her, give her teaching as she teaches your people. Give, her, give force to her message, Lord, is our prayer. We love you so much, Father, and we thank you ahead of time for answering this prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. I changed that. That's uh, forward, backward. Good evening, Saints at Apocalypse. Uh, tonight we're going to discuss the dangers of sugar. Many of us as, as at Venice love to indulge at the potlucks of all the sweet, tasty things after we eat our meal. And many of us consume too much sugar. The pen of inspiration says, our physical health is maintained by that which we eat. If our appetites are not under the control of a sanctified mind, if we are not temperate in all our eating and drinking, we shall not be in a state of mental and physical soundness. To study the word with a purpose to learn what saith the scripture, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Any unhealthful habit will produce an unhealthful condition in the system and the delicate living machinery of the stomach will be injured and will not be able to do its work properly. The diet has much to do with the disposition to enter into temptation and commit sin. So we're going to see how sugar really does affect our brain and how it affects our understanding, not only the word, but anything that we're trying to comprehend. So during my research, I've learned that the effects of sugar on the brain are absolutely alarming. So we're going to define sugar right now. It's defined as a sweet crystalline substance 
obtained from various plants, especially sugarcane and sugar beet, consisting essentially of sucrose and is used as a sweetener in food and drink. Now, there's an informal definition that gives you the true definition of what sugar really is. Sugar is a psychoactive drug in the form of white powder. A psychoactive drug, a psycho psychopharmaceutical or a psychotropic. It is a chemical substance that crosses the blood-brain barrier and acts primarily upon the central nervous system where it affects brain function, resulting in alteration in perception, mood, consciousness, cognition, and behavior. Now, does the Bible say anything directly about sugar? So we're going to go to Isaiah 43, 24. Actually, I'm going to pull it up on the screen. Thou hast bought me no sweet cane with money, neither hast thou filled me with the fat of thy sacrifices. But thou hast made me to serve with thy sins. Thou hast wearied me with thine iniquities. So we are indulgent in sin when we feed sugar to our brain. Dr. David Rubin, the author of Everything You Always Wanted to Know About Nutrition, says, white refined sugar is not a food. It's a pure chemical extracted from plant sources, purer in fact than cocaine, which it resembles in many ways. Its true name is sucrose. It has 12 carbon atoms, 22 hydrogen atoms, 11 oxygen atoms, and absolutely nothing else to offer. The chemical formula for, for cocaine is carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, and oxygen. Sugar's formula is carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. And for all practical purposes, the difference is that sugar is missing the nitrogen atom. Cocaine and sugar are highly addictive. So let's define refined sugars. Refined sugars is what America usually consumes the most. And we, as at Venice, are consuming about an equal amount. Refined sugar contains no fiber, no minerals, no proteins, no fat, no enzymes, only empty calories. What happens when you eat a refined carbohydrate like sugar? Your body must borrow vital nutrients from healthy cells to metabolize the incomplete food. Calcium, sodium, potassium, and magnesium are taken from various parts of the body to make of the use of this sugar. So can you see why, based on what you just heard from the previous presentation, why we really have to understand what we are putting in our body? And we have to understand when we say we're eating a healthy sugar, we have to do research to determine if it's really healthy. Now, refining means to make pure by a process of extraction. Now, I want you to pay attention to this because you're going to be very surprised at the end of this. Of extraction or separation. Sugars are refined by taking a natural food, which contains high percentage of sugars, and then removing all elements of that food until only the sugar remains. While sugar is commonly made from sugarcane or sugar beets, through heating and mechanical and chemical processing, all vitamins, minerals, proteins, fats, enzymes, and indeed every nutrient is removed until only the sugar remains. Sugar cane and sugar beets are first harvested and then chopped into small pieces, squeezing out the juice, which is then mixed with water. This liquid is then heated and lime is added. Moisture is boiled away and the remaining fluid is pumped into vacuum pans to concentrate the juice. And by this time, the liquid is starting to crystallize and is ready to be placed into a centrifuge machine where any remaining residue, like molasses, are spun away. The crystals are then dissolved by heating to the boiling point and passed through charcoal filters. Now, after the crystal condenses, they are bleached snow white, usually by the use of pork or cattle bones. So if you consume refined sugars, you are not a vegetarian. 
During the refining process, 64 food elements are destroyed. All the potassium, magnesium, calcium, iron, manganese, phosphate, and sulfate are removed. A, D, and B vitamins are destroyed, amino acids, vital, vital enzymes, unsaturated fats, and all fiber are gone. To a lesser or greater degree, all refined sweeteners such as corn syrup, maple syrup, etc., undergo a similar destructive process. Now, white sugar and brown sugar are two of the most commonly used types of sugar that most Americans consume. Um, simply because the brown version of certain kind of foods like rice or bread or pasta are more beneficial to health, people assume that brown sugar is good for you. Although many people are of the opinion that brown sugar is healthier than white sugar, the truth is that they only have a marginally different nutritional value. The molasses in brown sugar contains a number of minerals, which include calcium, potassium, magnesium, and iron, but since only very small amounts of these minerals are present in brown sugar, they don't bring any helpful benefits to the body. It is known that sugar has very little nutrients and both white and brown sugar do not do much to promote your health. So when you decide to go out and buy that organic brown sugar, step away from it. Now the single largest source of calories for America comes from sugar, specifically high fructose corn syrup. Sugar consumption tends of the past 300 years are as such. In the 1700s, the average person consumed about four pounds of sugar per year. In the 1800s, the average person consumed about 18 pounds of sugar per year. And in the 1900s, we consumed 90 pounds of sugar per year. Today, more than 50% of all Americans consume one half pound of sugar per day, translating to a whopping 180 pounds of sugar per year. Isn't that nice? Does that look nice to you? Well, it shouldn't. Far too much sugar is ordinarily used in food. Cakes, sweet puddings, pastries, jellies, jams are active causes of indigestion. Especially harmful are the custards and puddings in which milk, eggs, and sugars are the chief ingredients. The free use of milk and sugar taken together should be avoided. Ministry of Healing 302-1905. Now, I'm going to go over a few of the toxic effects of sugar, but I'm not going to read all of them for the interest of time. I'm going to read the ones that are most startling to me. Premature aging, suppresses immunity, disturbs mineral balance. It raises your cholesterol and triglycerides, and it has an increased risk of Alzheimer's disease. Mm. Hormonal imbalance, appendicitis, and decreased growth hormones, fatty liver, fluid retention, and of course many more. Sugar is a very dangerous substance when it's refined. Now what forms of sugar are we, especially as Adventists, consuming today? Dectrose, fructose, and glucose are all monosaccharides known as simple sugars. Primarily, the primary difference between them is how your body metabolizes them. Now, glucose and dextrose are essentially the same sugar. However, food manufacturers usually use the term dextrose in their ingredient list. Simple sugars can combine to form more complex sugars like disaccharides, sucrose, which is white table sugar. High fructose corn syrup is 55% fructose and 45% glucose. Ethanol, drinking alcohol, is not a sugar, although beer and wine contain residual sugars and starches in addition to alcohol. And those starches and sugars turn into uh, glucose and fructose. Now, sugar alcohols like xylitol, which we have here, glycerol, zorbitol, malitol, mannitol, and erythritol, excuse me, are neither sugars nor alcohols, but are becoming increasingly popular as sweeteners. 
They are incompletely absorbed from your small intestines for the most part, and they provide fewer calories than sugar, but often cause problems with bloating, diarrhea, and flagellants. Splenda is not a sugar, despite the sugar-like name and deceptive marketing slogan, made from sugar. It's a chlorinated artificial sweetener with aspartame and saccharin, which is detrimental to your health. Agave syrup is falsely advertised as natural. It's typically highly processed and is usually 80% fructose. The end product does not even remotely resemble the original agave plant. Now we're going to go over a few of the sugars that we consume today. Now agave syrup is a sweetener derived from agave, a desert plant found in western and southern United States and Mexico and parts of central and South America. Agave is more popularly known as a plant used to make tequila. But agave syrup has actually been used for thousands of years as a food ingredient. Mexicans call it is aguamiel or honey water because it is about 40% sweeter than sugar. Agave syrup contains the highest amount of fructose, anywhere between 70 to 90% depending on the brand. Agave syrup is highly processed sweetener. Food manufacturers would like you to believe that the agave nectar flows from the agave plant to the jar when it's in reality the syrup is produced similarly to how cornstarch turns to high fructose corn syrup. Agave syrup is highly addictive because it is basically a sweeter and highly concentrated form of sugar. Agave syrup may be a highly sprayed crop as well. It has no nutritional value, contains large amounts of toxic steroid derivatives called saponins, and agave syrup may contain an organic heat form contaminant called HMF. So let's talk about honey. Honey is about 53% fructose, but is completely natural in its raw form and has many health benefits when used in moderation, including as many antioxidants as spinach. Now, what does the Bible say about a natural healthy sweetener? Proverbs 16:24 says, pleasant words are as honeycomb, sweet to the soul and health to the bone. 25.27 says, it is not good to eat much honey, so for men to search their own glory is not glory. True temperance teaches us to dispense entirely with everything hurtful and to use judiciously that which is helpful. Temperance 138.2. So even though honey is very good for us, we need to use it in moderation. Okay, let's look at coconut sugar. Coconut sugar is the boiled and dehydrated sap of the coconut palm. Coconut sugar is, isn't a nutritional superfood, but it does offer more vitamins and minerals than white table sugar. Coconut sugar also provides small amounts of uh, phytonutrients such as polyphenols, flavonoids, and other antioxidants. You also find the B vitamins in a saw, often used as a mood booster in coconut sugar. Now agave nectar is 90% fructose and high fructose corn syrup is about 55% fructose and coconut sugar has just about 45% fructose. Now re recent researches indicate that maple syrup, which is many people that I know choose to use maple syrup, uh, may have a powerful medical benefit. A recent study found that over 20 compounds in pure maple syrup that support health, 13 of which are first-time discoveries. Several of these new compounds exhibit anti-cancer fighting agencies and antibacterial uh, fighting agencies. Now maple syrup also has a powerful vitamin and mineral profile, which furthers its health promoting capacity. Now maple syrup is real, real thin when it comes out of the tree and the sap contains mainly water, so it has to be reduced down and boiled down and boiled down. Now, sometimes some of the benefits are removed, but not many. 
and many of good nutrients remain in maple syrup. Natural sugars. To most dietitians and food experts, natural sugar is the kind of sugar contained in fruits, vegetables, and other plants. Now, most of, most of these sugars occur as fructose through glucose and sucrose and can also be found in some foods. They are natural to, for two reasons, because they occur on their own and because they are not manipulated or extracted by humans. Now, all sugars are not created equal. In spite of what you might have been told, glucose is the form of energy your cells were actually designed to run on. And in fact, nearly every living thing on earth uses glucose for energy. But as a country, regular cane sugar, or sucrose, is no longer the sugar of choice. It's now fructose. So why is fructose so dangerous? The large production of fructose came about in the 1970s as a result of technology that made high fructose corn syrup far less expensive to produce. So as fructose is the primary sugar in most fruits, it isn't that fructose is evil, it's just that massive doses you and your families are exposed to that make it dangerous. Because it is so cheap and makes food taste so much better, it's added to virtually every processed food. So every processed food that we usually pick up in the store has some form of sugar, and it's usually fructose. Now there are two overall reasons fructose is so damaging to your body. Fructose is broken down in your liver just like alcohol and produces many of the side effects of chronic alcohol use, right down to the beer belly. People are consuming fructose in quantities that are 400 to 800 percent higher than they were a hundred years ago. Now due to its pervasive presence in just about all processed foods, it's really, really bad for you. Now, because of the increasing awareness of the danger of high fructose corn syrups, people have turned to the healthier sugar alternatives, which is what food manufacturers are marketing agave syrup to be. But don't be fooled. According to Dr. Joseph Mercola, agave syrup is actually worse than high fructose corn syrup. Now, when we take in sugar, it clogs the system. It hinders the working of the living machine. That's Councils on Diets and Foods 327. And Elvin just went over, our brother Bridges just went over many of, <laughs> of, uh, of those principles when he was speaking about the mind and diet. So let's take a quick look at processed food health risk. Food processing removes some of the nutrients, vitamins, and fiber present in your food. Cheap artificial sugars, salt, preservatives, and processed foods have less fiber quantity and don't add any nutritional benefits. It slows down your digestion as well. Processed foods are highly addictive because they have fructose corn syrup in them. Some processed dairy products, dried fruits, etc., contain sulfite, which causes a range of health diseases. And processed foods kills natural taste and color of foods. In order to restore the natural flavor, manufacturers add cheap artificial sugars. These artificial sugars, salts, and fats cause gastrointestinal problems, hormonal problems, nervous system problems, etc. Now, what does soda do to your body? Contrary to popular belief, many of Adventists today do consume soda, which we should not be consuming. Within 20 minutes, your blood sugar spikes and your liver responds to the resulting insulin burst by turning massive amounts of sugar into fat. Within 40 minutes, caffeine absorption is complete. Your pupils are dilated, your blood pressure rises, and your liver dumps more sugar into your bloodstream. Around 45 minutes, your body increases dopamine production, which stimulates the pleasure centers of your brain. A physically identical response to that of heroin, by the way. After 60 minutes, you'll start to have a blood sugar crash, and you may be tempted to reach for another sweet snack or beverage. 
Now these are five disturbing facts about soda. It can be used to clean a toilet, use it with a ball of aluminum foil for rust or chrome, it can clean corrosion from car batteries, you can use it to loosen a rusted bolt, hazardous material signs are required on trucks carrying concentrated ingredients like soda. Evaporated cane sugar, I'm going to go over this. In the true sense of them, evaporated cane juice or evaporated cane sugar would simply mean that sugar cane juice has been evaporated, leaving the sugar crystals with their nutrients still intact. However, that is not the case for the type of evaporated cane juice that is being used in foods today. According to Athakar Sugar Company in Costa Rica, which provides raw sugar to U.S. companies, the term is wrongly used in food industry. He says it's prostituted. Nowadays, the food industries, uh, our companies are trying to sell more natural products, so they use the most impressive or high-impact words to call the consumer's attention. He said when it comes down to it, the kind of sugar that is wrongly called evaporated cane juice and white sugars are not much different. Councils on Diets and Foods says sugar is not good for the stomach. It causes fermentation, clouds the brain, and brings peevishness into the disposition. Now, we've been brainwashed to believe that sugar is good for us. Now, it's becoming increasingly clear that the same pathological process that leads to insulin resistance and type 2 diabetes may also hold true for your brain. As you overindulge on sugar and grains, your brain becomes overwhelmed by the consistently high levels of glucose and insulin that blunts its insulin signaling, leading to impairment in your thinking and memory abilities, eventually causing permanent brain damage. Can you imagine that? Additionally, when your liver is busy processing fructose, it severely hampers its ability to make cholesterol an essential building block of your brain that is crucial for optimal brain function. Indeed, mounting evidence supports the notion that significantly reducing the fructose consumption is a very important step for presenting, preventing Alzheimer's disease. So many of the studies that I, I researched showed that there was a common link to Alzheimer's disease and sugar. Now, this is a picture of two different brains. The brain responses to glucose and fructose ingestion show distinctly different patterns. The glucose reduced blood flow and activity in the brain region that controls appetite and reward regions shown in blue on the left. In contrast to the appetite and reward regions remain active after fructose ingestions, but activity in memory and sensory perception was suppressed. These images represent composite data from 20 healthy adult volunteers. So the, when they ate good sugars, it reduced the blood flow and activity in the brain regions that controlled their appetite. But when they ate bad sugars, it increased it and it caused their reward regions to remain active. So we're going to have a little short video. I want you to pay close attention. Picture warm, gooey cookies, crunchy candies, velvety cakes, waffle cones piled high with ice cream. Is your mouth watering? Are you craving dessert? Why? What happens in the brain that makes sugary foods so hard to resist? Sugar is a general term used to describe a class of molecules called carbohydrates, and it's found in a wide variety of food and drink. Just check the labels on sweet products you buy. Glucose, fructose, sucrose, maltose, lactose, dextrose, and starch are all forms of sugar. So are high fructose corn syrup, fruit juice, raw sugar, and honey. And sugar isn't just in candies and desserts. It's also added to tomato sauce, yogurt, dried fruit, flavored waters, or granola bars. Since sugar is everywhere, it's important to understand how it affects the brain. What happens when sugar hits your tongue? And does eating a little bit of sugar make you crave more? You take a bite of cereal. The sugars it contains activate the sweet taste receptors, part of the taste buds on the tongue. 
These receptors send a signal up to the brainstem, and from there it forks off into many areas of the forebrain, one of which is the cerebral cortex. Different sections of the cerebral cortex process different tastes, bitter, salty, umami, and in our case, sweet. From here, the signal activates the brain's reward system. This reward system is a series of electrical and chemical pathways across several different regions of the brain. It's a complicated network, but it helps answer a single subconscious question. Should I do that again? That warm, fuzzy feeling you get when you taste grandma's chocolate cake? That's your reward system saying, mmm, yes. And it's not just activated by food. Socializing, sexual behavior, and drugs are just a few examples of things and experiences that also activate the reward system. But overactivating this reward system kickstarts a series of unfortunate events, loss of control, craving, and increased tolerance to sugar. Let's get back to our bite of cereal. It travels down into your stomach and eventually into your gut. And guess what? There are sugar receptors here too. They're not taste buds, but they do send signals telling your brain that you're full or that your body should produce more insulin to deal with the extra sugar you're eating. The major currency of our reward system is dopamine, an important chemical or neurotransmitter. There are many dopamine receptors in the forebrain, but they're not evenly distributed. Certain areas contain dense clusters of receptors, and these dopamine hotspots are a part of our reward system. Drugs like alcohol, nicotine, or heroin send dopamine into overdrive, leading some people to constantly seek that high. In other words, to be addicted. Sugar also causes dopamine to be released, though not as violently as drugs. And sugar is rare among dopamine-inducing foods. Broccoli, for example, has no effect, which probably explains why it's so hard to get kids to eat their veggies. Speaking of healthy foods, let's say you're hungry and decide to eat a balanced meal. You do, and dopamine levels spike in the reward system hotspots. But if you eat that same dish many days in a row, dopamine levels will spike less and less, eventually leveling out. That's because when it comes to food, the brain evolved to pay special attention to new or different tastes. Why? Two reasons. First, to detect food that's gone bad. And second, because the more variety we have in our diet, the more likely we are to get all the nutrients we need. To keep that variety up, we need to be able to recognize a new food, and more importantly, we need to want to keep eating new foods. And that's why the dopamine levels off when a food becomes boring. Now back to that meal. What happens if in place of the healthy, balanced dish, you eat sugar-rich food instead? If you rarely eat sugar, or don't eat much at a time, the effect is similar to that of the balanced meal. But if you eat too much, the dopamine response does not level out. In other words, eating lots of sugar will continue to feel rewarding. In this way, sugar behaves a little bit like a drug. It's one reason people seem to be hooked on sugary foods. So think back to all those different kinds of sugar. Each one is unique, but every time any sugar is consumed, it kickstarts a domino effect in the brain that sparks a rewarding feeling. Too much too often, and things can go into overdrive. So yes, overconsumption of sugar can have addictive effects on the brain. But a wedge of cake once in a while won't hurt you. It is better to let sweet things alone, let alone those sweet dessert dishes that are placed on the table. You don't need them. You want a clear mind to think after God's order. Review and Harold, January 7th, 1902. In the interest of time, we're going to close at this point. I'd like to ask Brother Bridges to come up and join me as we pray. Just a quick testimony. Um, we've been married about 18 years, 18 and a half. And remember when we used to drink Pepsi more than water? We had. We had the cube with 24 packs, and we had a wall, and we had like three or four rows stacked across the whole wall. We had regular Pepsi and cherry, wild cherry Pepsi. Mm. Yes, but God is good. He helped us to overcome. We all struggle with appetite. He can help you if you're struggling to overcome too. Amen? Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. Let us pray. Father, we come before your throne. We give thanks and honor and glory to you for your wonderful, wonderful truths. We pray that 
the class here and those viewers who are listening via the Apocalypse Channel have been blessed. We pray that they would take the information that they receive regarding diet tonight and study it out for themselves. Mm -hmm. The things that we put in our body pre may prevent us from having that connection with Christ. Mm -hmm. It is such an important issue of vital importance that it can keep us out of the kingdom of God. Please, Lord, touch your people that they would investigate these matters for themselves. Bless us all as we in go our separate ways this night with travel mercies and those who are viewing as we continue to process this information that you have so blessedly given us so that we can share it with your people. Amen. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.